I can't go see what's going on. That's sophistication. You know what I'm saying? He's pointing at sophistication. <laughs> hey. Hey, Chan. That's the first thing I did, though. Hey, look, Chan. I walked over there. Look, what you saying? <laughs> Here's the thing. I'm going to point to people who ain't there. I don't care. I see. Yeah, you don't have to be there. You was to trick me. I'd be like, what? what? <laughs> hey, here's the other thing, too. Nobody knows who's outside the picture. <laughs> they only know who's in the picture, dog. <laughs> What's up, man? How you doing? Good to see you again, bro. Yes, sir, man. Pleasure. What's up, bro? Respect, big dog. You got it. For sure. For sure. For sure. Chan, it'll f you up, bro. See salt water. Huh? You drink salt water? Warm water and half a teaspoon of sea salt. Don't I'm ready. Get you right. Yeah, I, just I mean, they talking about system. pooping. No, I'm talking <laughs> about <laughs> talking about bowel movements. <laughs> <laughs> he got he got irritable bowel syndrome. Though, man, so. take this all my business, man. <laughs> man, man. <laughs> <laughs> like, listen, I just met this. <laughs> it's all right. hey, he's explosive. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it, lets, it lets him know who we are, man. Oh, okay. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Make him more comfortable. So what's your thing, then? Oh, hell, I don't have no insides. <laughs> wait, wait, no insides. I don't have no spleen, no gallbladder, piece of my liver. He, he died. Wow. He was dead. When you died? I wasn't. I didn't die. I almost died. It's difference. Rest in peace, mother. And NDE for real, though? Huh? You had an NDE for real? Yeah, no, I'd have an NDE. He's being silly. Oh, OK. Yeah, it's, can we talking to me? I grew up in Brooklyn, man. Like, they see it different. Like, you can't tell jokes like that. He thought I really died. He thought they had to resuscitate me. Right. <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm I saying? did, I did. Man, live a different life. I was about to ask some questions. Yeah. Like, so, so what did you see on that side? Like, <laughs> is, is, it, is it true? <laughs> yeah, no. Is there something else? <laughs> yeah. Hold up. Limitless. Make a stomach cow pinning it. I thought they here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Way I'm feeling got me up. On the mission got me up. Knowing me, I got the key. On the vision, I can trust. Trust. Limitless. Make a stomach cow pinning it. I thought they here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Way I'm feeling got me up. On the mission got me up. Knowing me. Hey man, Joey, welcome to the show. Uh, yes, welcome sir. to the pivot. Freddie T, I'm RC. This is Chan. Joey Badass, go ahead, tell Are you cussing now? I'm not cussing. <laughs> Normally when I say his name, I spell it. I say Joey Bad ASS. Don't do that. Or Joey Bad Tail, but it's the show, and I can't introduce him as that. From now on, he just gonna he be Joey. He you Bad Tail, can he? Bad Tail's no good. <laughs> <laughs> just, just call him unique. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he a lot more than that, but the reason you're here, and we want to get into all the things you've accomplished in your career, also, you know, being a father and how those certain things have changed you, but for us, it's about what you're doing at this stage of your life, being so young, 28 years old, starting Impact Men, and you capitalize Men, Torship. Tell us a little bit about, about why that initiative was so important to you. Also, why it was important to say it wasn't just about black men, but empowering and teaching or mentoring all men of color. Right, giving back to the community that I'm from, the community that it was, so hard to reach out of and, um, you know, to seek those higher places in life is something that's always been important to me. With this program specifically, or this initiative specifically, I was um, directly inspired by a good friend of mine, Sophia Chang. She has a mentorship program for women of color that I've been a part of for two years. And um, upon coming back on as a mentor for her 2024 program, I posted it on my Instagram and I saw, I couldn't help but notice a few of the comments in the section, like, oh, there's, no, there's never anything for black men or for men of color and things like that. So, you know, I hate my good friend, Soph, and I'm like, we gotta do this. Yeah, we started talking about it two and a half months ago, and we brought it to fruition pretty quickly, so I'm really proud of that. I'm really excited to continue to move in it forward. It's definitely something that I plan on doing for as long as I possibly can. You know, I, I want it to be a program that, like, lives on forever, if possible. You know, so this was just the first year. This is 2024. We got 25 mentors. We're going to find 25 mentees for them. And um, yeah, you know, next year I, I plan on expanding bigger and bigger. Maybe I could have you guys on. 
That'd be awesome. His mentors next year. Yeah. yeah. Just to go a step further, um, I was also reading some of your comments about the program. You know, there are a few comments in there where people would say, well, I'm white. Right. Does that exclude me? Absolutely. What would be your answer to that? So my answer to that would be, okay, so here's a program. I, I feel like, you know, because I have such a wide reach, you know, it's reached probably a million people at this point. However, these are still just 25 individuals mm -hmm. that I'm making a pathway for as a result of this program. Right. You know what I'm saying? So I want all of the non-men of color to remember that. You know what I'm saying? This is still a program that is providing a pathway for just 25 people. You know, like, that's a small classroom, if you will. As much as promotion and publicity that it has received, it's still just this small group of people. You know what I'm saying? That are underrepresented in this world and underprivileged in this world. So it's like, yeah, you know, I stand firm on that. I don't mean to exclude, you know, uh, any of my white followers or fans, you know, like a deliberate reason. It's like, you know, n nothing against them, but this is just me trying to make a pathway and a path for people who don't have access to those resources as much or information or knowledge or opportunity. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's not about the exclusion, it's more about who you're including. Right. It's about making sure some of the underprivileged people, some of the people that these programs weren't available to historically, now having an opportunity to come from Bed-Stuy to be someone that made it out of that community, to dive back into those communities or into the people who have grown up in some of the same circumstances as you that you can relate to or that your mentors can relate to. And I think a lot of times that gets confused or misunderstood as discrimination when it truly isn't. It's about inclusion. But I want to go back to why these things would be important to you. You know, you started writing extremely young. You know, you say you wrote Old Girl. I guess it's never going to come out. I think you said you wrote it you're like 13, 14, about puppy love. Now, so when I was... you, you said you wrote a song, yeah. right? That you were asked, what was the first song you wrote? You say you wrote it when you were young. It was about puppy love. I think you said it was called Old Girl or something like that. You never recorded it. Oh, wow. Where'd you pull that from? Hey, he like He's that. like, he like Narwhal or something. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know, so, you know, you, you, you start writing, then start out with Pro Era. You have partners, mixtape tours, mixtape circuit, stuff like that. Now you're acting. One of the best, honestly, in my, my opinion, one of the best young guys who've made the transition from, you know, music to the big screen or to the small screen. For you, what was it like growing up in New York, having the influence of such, you know, the Nas's, the Jay-Z's, all of these people, and then being your age and that not necessarily being where hip hop is, where it's not about the lyricism, which is something you focus on, how much did being in New York influence you? Oh, man, I got to say, New York influenced damn near everything about me, you know, just from the fast-paced tempo of the city, you know, just that upbeat feeling like you got to get to it, you got to get to the next thing, always feeling constantly motivated. And then also, you know, specifically me being from Brooklyn, New York, which is like, I've always told people, a melting pot of the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Of, of many different cultures and things like that. So I feel like I came up really open-minded to different, like, perspectives and different views that ultimately just made me an open-minded individual entering this world. And as far as, like, you know, the, the musical influence, I got to shout out my parents on that, you know, because they were avid music listeners, not just hip-hop, you know, like, from country music to soul to pop rock you know everything but when it came to brooklyn biggie and jay-z was champion you know what i'm saying so i want to say those were two of my earliest influences as um, it came to to music so even when i got older i was about 17 years old those are still the people i regarded as the greats you know what i mean i wanted to be adjacent to them you know um, as far as like rhyme styles or technique or skill you know, so that's that's pretty much what pushed my pen early on. Bro, you a young dude, you're only 28 now. You've been around for a second. What how, what made you grow up so fast? Is it Brooklyn? Is it um, is it the struggle? Because you you I would say just watching you act, watching you do music, watching you talk, just the way you hold yourself. You're you're a, he's a an old soul. You're an old sure. soul, but what created that? 
Well, I would say, you know, I always gravitated to people who were older than me, which is kind of ironic now, I guess, that I'm doing the mentorship program. It kind of feels like exactly what I'm supposed to do because as a younger guy, you know, than I am now, <laughs> I was raised in a way where to be a leader and not a follower. So, you know, what I got from hanging out with older people was they were better leaders than like, you know, the younger community that I guess I was uh, surrounded with, like in school and stuff like that. So definitely that. And um, I mean, I don't know, I guess I just do a lot of old can I, can I curse? Yeah, you <laughs> curse, for sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I live like I'm like 40. It's, it's kind of it's kind of crazy. Like, sometimes I feel like I got this Benjamin Button thing going on, where it's like, I started old, but I'm just getting younger every year now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just going over, like... yeah I'm just aging in reverse, you know? Yeah. Perception is a game, um, I guess, played by the mind's eye, right? And we tend to, um, I guess, it's triggered by our curiosity. So we've all learned, or they tell us, never judge a book by its cover. But you went to uh, Edward R. Morrow, you know, prestigious performing arts school. And I, I believe there you start honing your love for film. And I think a notable alumni is Basquiat. Knowing he was there, did that give you a mindset when you were a student there that you can go on and be as legendary in your acting and in your, you know, in your, your craft and everything? First of all, you... great, great question. And why that's so great to me, because yes, so when you used to enter Edward R. Murrow at the front entrance, as soon as you come in and you make a right, there's a wall of famous alumni. And you know, Basquiat's name was obvious there, obviously there, Adam Yock from the Beastie Boys, mm -hmm. Little Mama, just amongst a few of notable names. But I used to always see that. I remember the first day of school looking at that board and being like, my name's gonna be there one day. You know, so like it's, that fully inspired me, knowing that, you know, such greatness walked these halls, you know, before me. Definitely made me feel as if it was, I was gonna be another one, you know? You could see that influence in the way you've done music, obviously in the way that you portray the characters you're cast to play, but in making that decision, right? There are different ways you can go, whether it's the streets have a pull, a pull on you or wanting to be part of a crowd that you're familiar with. What was it that made you want to set yourself apart and take the path of attending a prestigious performing art school in that manner. And also you said acting was always something you wanted to do. How did you have such you know, lofty goals and big dreams coming from a place where you don't always see people making out? What even shifted me in the direction of film and you know, TV and theater and things like that was when I was graduating middle school after making my puppy love songs and <laughs> you know, all of this stuff for the first time, I realized that there were no specialized knowledge programs or courses for, you know, people who wanted to do what I wanted to do. And that was make music, specifically rap music, you know, or even R&B or whatever. There was just no program for that. Like, it, it just didn't exist. So I had to figure out what was the next best thing, what was the next thing that was gonna drive my motivation to want to go to school and things like that. And, you know, the next thing that came up to mind was theater, because that was the closest thing to film. So, you know, I, I actually auditioned for a few theater schools like LaGuardia and um, Edward R. Murrow. Uh, my attendance was a little too bad for LaGuardia, <laughs> but Murrow was like, come on, boy, we got you, you yeah. know? So um, that's kind of how that ended up happening. That mid-ground, because just listening to you and then listen to some of your rhymes, you know, you, you, and, like, you get nasty, you talk But then you grew up with a good structure. You had parents, you went to private schools. You oh, know? I didn't go to private school. Oh, you went to the, the top-notch schools, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Oh, no, it wasn't top-notch. <laughs> it wasn't top. It was, it was a lot nicer than most guys. For sure. In that For situation. Sure. Like, did you ever, I guess I'm saying, like, to run that line, RC kind of hit on it, to run that line of like the streets, yeah. the hood being cool, but also like you said, you had bigger goals. You had goals that some dudes out there don't even think about. For sure. And, and walk that line and be in those streets, dealing with those thugs, whatever you want to call them, but also stand on the path to where you are now. Absolutely. What's, what was that, what was that type rope well, like? Like balance it, so for me, my family, you know, all of like the older men in my family were always closely tied to the streets. So I always viewed that road as something that was so easy. 
it was so tangible. I could just go like that and be a part of it and grab it and touch it. So I, I feel like that kind of made me want to do other things for myself. Because I was like, okay, everybody do it. Like, like, again, you know, I was raised with the mentality of be a leader, not a follower. So I'm like, okay, they all, all my older cousins, uncles, they doing that. Let me be different. You know what I mean? I was always inspired to be different, and that's something that my mom's instilled in me from young. You know, so that's, that's, that's pretty much what it, what it was. Like, even with, with TV and film, like, I still, that whole mindset is, is closely connected because I dodged a role like unique for so long. Mm -hmm. Because again, I just felt that that was so easy for me to do. It was so easy to channel that, to tap into that. But I wanted to show people that I could actually act. I wanted to show people some range with doing roles like Carter from To This Is Strangers First or Leon and Mr. Robot. Mr. Robot like, you yeah. know what I'm saying? Giving people more range and dynamic to a young black man. I didn't want them to just think that, you know, I could, I just had to be a street kid or I just had to be a street dude or a drug dealer or something like that. And that was my mindset growing up too. It's like, yo, I, I was never far from that stuff. I just chose to do my own thing. I was like, okay, you know, I'm a skateboard. <laughs> I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna rap, you know what I mean? And I'm gonna just, yeah, I'm gonna just try to make a lane this way. It, it was even with like, you know, things like smoking weed. Like they was, all my cousins and all that, they was, weed been around me my whole life. I mean, it eventually got in. I guess it was in my DNA. <laughs> <laughs> that, that eventually yeah. found me. <laughs> it won after a while. But, but yeah, for a while, I was like, I ain't never gonna smoke weed. Like, y'all y'all do that thing? Yeah, yeah, that, that didn't last, but. <laughs> you tried. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I tried. But just, just that mindset was always present in self, you know what I'm saying? To just dare to be different, you know what I'm saying? And challenge myself. You know, I told you uh, when we saw you on the plane, headed here, I was like, hey man, ignore those DMs. I am one of those people, like, I love TV, I love movies, right? And so, I was actually on the plane watching Raising Canaan, and I DM'd you from the plane. I went and looked up at Instagram. Not on this plane. Not on this plane, no, this was, this oh, okay. was actually September 11th, 2022, because like I went to check. Like 10 planes it. ago. Hey, because there was a day, <laughs> there's probably like 100 planes ago. I was oh, actually oh, gonna right. go back and unsend it once I realized he was gonna be on the show, because I didn't want him to walk up and be like, dang, man, I got like two deals for you. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, and one, you play the role e extremely well, and you play it with a ton of, and I don't know if these words actually match who Unique is supposed to be, but you play it with a ton of grace and poise, right? And you look at Cats from the 90s, and I think it's captured so well, especially now realizing that you are so young, you know? And I think that's a, that's a skill, too. But you say you dodged that role. What puts you at a place where that role was finally one you felt comfortable taking? I felt as if I had made my point. You know, I was like, okay, I've shown people that I can act. So now when I step into a role like this, it's not anything that I will be boxed into. Because that's, that's what I was afraid of. You know what I'm saying? Like, we've seen it happen. They always want us to be the, the drug dealers or the crackheads and stuff like that. You know, I, I, just, I just ain't want to get pigeonholed. I guess I, I built the rapport with the industry and um, I landed all of those other roles that were just in different veins. I was like, you know what? I'm ready for my shoot 'em up, bang, bang joint. I'm ready, you <laughs> right. know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's, like, it's like taking on the action role now. Like, right. I'm like, yeah, I'm excited about this now. You know what I mean? I, could, I feel like I could bring the, the energy to this now without um, you know, people thinking that I was just one dimensional. And your recent BT hip hop performance, you know, you did a song in memory of a lot of the hip hop legends that we lost. Young Dolph, I mean, XX, Extension, just a lot of the guys, right? And uh, one of your messages was stop perpetuating uh, genocide on, on, on ourselves. We are our biggest ops. Got to stop blaming the judges and the cops. Uh, could you expound on that? Yeah, man, you know, I feel like a lot of what takes place in our culture is, you know, it's become trendy to self-destruct. Uh, self-hate in our culture is such a trend, you know, especially in hip-hop music. You know, a lot of regurgitated messages of, you know, killing each other and just 
doing foul acts to each other, and it's like, I feel like if we ever gonna really, you know, progress and move, first of all, I believe that music is one of the most powerful forces in the world, next to love, right? You got love, then you got music, which is sound, essentially, you know? So I feel like if we're ever gonna really make a conscious change and a conscious shift in our nation as black people, it starts with the music. It starts with the messages that's being programmed into our babies. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, the subconscious mind or children, they can't tell the difference. You know what I mean? They growing up and the glorification of everything was going on, the toxicity in our culture is being championed. So why wouldn't they want to continue that, you know, as they grow up? And I just like to use myself as an instrument or a beacon of the other way. Like, pretty much what I've been doing since a kid. You know, everybody on that, like, let's do this, you know. Do you think the uh, repetitive messages that we were just mentioned with the gun violence and this and that, those different stereotypes that come with the music that we hear a lot of, a lot of people sound the same. But Do you think that has influenced the decline in sales that are, that's floating around the uh, Oh yeah, internet? absolutely. I think absolutely. it's now like 40% or something. Absolutely, you know, there's uh, less innovation happening. And don't get me wrong, it's like, you know, I don't want to come off as somebody who's like, oh, like, because a lot of this stuff is people communicating their real life stories. You know what I mean? But after a while, it goes beyond communicating your life story and perpetuating a behavior. You know what I'm saying? I feel like just once you make it somewhere at a certain point in your life where you're able to avoid situations of the past that you couldn't avoid before, then you need to speak towards that. And you need to feed that energy into people to get to that place rather than staying where they're at. Correct. When you're like, you know, living in a mansion or, you got seven bodyguards, you know what I'm saying? And you still talking like you the dude on the block who, yeah, so. Yeah, and I would say to know what people want to hear. That's what it, really what it is. People want to hear, you've been hearing it since it was kids, NWA, Biggie, Pac, all the dudes you listen to. Right. We're talking about, you know, the shooting up, the, the gangster stuff like for that. For sure. And for you to make a conscious effort not to put that in the kids' ears, knowing that that's going to take money out your pocket. For, for sure. And, I mean, for me, it's also about moderation. Like I said, right, like we all have experiences that probably weren't the most brightest and shiny. And it's like, if you choose to express that and speak on that in your art, then, you know, that's by all means fine. But at some point, it got to be some type of restoration of the balance, right? It's like, okay, cool. Like, yeah, this is what I've been through and this is what I experienced. However, this ain't what you should do. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I ain't telling you to do that. It's part of communicating it the right, right. way, too. Right, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I feel like music, Music is pretty much almost like the history books of the time, if that makes sense. You know what I'm saying? You could go back to any point in time and you listen to the music and you should be able to get in a feel of what was going on. I think Maya Angelou had like a quote like that or something where she said, um, she said something like that. I, I can't, uh, you know, remember it exactly. But yeah, you know, that, that type of thing, the balance is very important to me. What's ultimately affecting the children and the next generations is very important to me. Always has, always will. It's like, but don't get me wrong. It's like, I don't give a fuck about a lot of shit, but there's, I give a fuck about the right mm. You know? It makes perfect sense. I always say, and I haven't said it in a while, but I have this thing where I say exposure leads to expansion. I know you talk about self-improvement, you know, men challenging themselves daily in order to be, be better. So I can imagine that's why the impact mentorship is, you know, priority for you. Right, and I, I love that quote, by the way, exposure leads to expansion, because, you know, the truth is, most of us ain't gonna pick up a book. What you know what I'm saying? Shit, I'll add another layer to it, exposure, expansion, experience. Right. You know, they say experience is the best teacher, so most, most people rely on that solely. You know what I'm saying? That's why I think mentorship is definitely something that's fruitful for our community because it's more tied with that experience aspect of it rather than that real self-driven drive to like want to go chase some new knowledge or anything. You know what I'm saying? Which I think is, is, is very important still, but it's just a reality. I used to feel so devastated. I thought I'd never make it, but now we're on our way to greatness and all it took was patience. My, my first question is, how difficult is it to be patient and wait for certain things to happen that you feel like you deserve right now? Oh, very difficult. I mean, 
that's why faith is so important. You know, um, I believe when it comes to like, you know, manifestation and pushing yourself closer to the things that you want, it's a combination of faith, determination, and action. Usually a person is missing one thing. Usually, you know, people have the talent, but they don't have the marketing skill set. You know what I'm saying? So it's a combination, you know, it goes back to what you said. Exposure leads to, what was it? Expansion. I love that. I love, I'm, I'm taking that. <laughs> you know, Add experience to it. You gonna hear that on the album, right there. For sure. You gonna hear that on the album right there, you know, but it's, it's that same concept right there. You might get impatient, but it's like, are you, are you doing all the things though? Hmm. Or are you just expecting? You know what I mean? Like when it comes to manifestation, say you got, say the dream is in California, but you in New York, you got to meet God in Oklahoma. You know what I'm saying? It's like, it's like a halfway thing. You can't just Expect be it. sitting in New York like, mm -hmm. when, the, when my flight going to get here? Like, nah, you got you to gotta push yourself too. How close do you feel you are to that point where you can impact all of the people you want to. You know, you're starting with your impact mentorship, but you know, you mentioned your fans and you know, some of the white fans, but having that sort of reach, how close do you feel you are in your career, in your life, in your branding, to being able to touch all the people you set out to touch and to help change their lives? Oh, I think I'm there, brother. I think I'm, I think I'm there. I've been there for a while. I think what happens now on a daily basis or as time goes on is I become more and more aware of what that reach is and of what's possible to, to do, of how I can extend my talents or my love for people and to create pathways for them. You know what I'm saying? So that was just, that's the path of impact mentorship, but it's definitely gonna be more things to come in that same vein, you know what I mean, on that same frequency. Like, the dope thing about Impact Mentorship is, is year round. So I'll just be sitting in the house and it's like, the work is being done. You know what I mean? And um, I look forward to creating more opportunities like that. You like being a star though? Like when you post from your, uh... Your recent, what is that, August or something like that? Your recent vacation, you like that everybody's in your business now? Like that, that, that. Um, it, it, how different is that to have a relationship that people care about? It's, um, it's interesting, but I'll say this, right? Like, I've always been like a pretty private person. However, when it comes to this specific matter, I look at myself as, like, I look at this as an opportunity to show the world black love in a very high frequency. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I, I'm i for my people. You know what I mean? And I, I want to leave a positive example for them, you know? So if them knowing a little bit is the sacrifice to inspire them, black people, black couples who want to stay together and to want to build together, then cool. I get a little something here and there, you know what I mean? If that's gonna mean that more of us gonna stay together and, and all of that, yeah, for sure. It's super dope, though, that both of y'all can be on the song, Show Me, right? Yeah. And then just some of the words from the song, can't spell us without trust. Word. Baby, not baby, open up, but um, help me out, bro. Can't Show spell song, us bro. without trust. Close your legs for a bit, baby. Let's open up. Let's open up. Closed mouths don't get fed. Finish your lunch. I ain't been on tour in a little minute, so I was right, like, wait. Right, right, right. I was like, damn, I thought you was gonna make that. Real. I thought you was gonna make that nasty. Honestly. <laughs> no, I wasn't I gonna make that nasty. When he said open up, I was like, here we go. Nah, 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 here we go. go. No, nah, he said put the lust aside. Yeah. Put the lust aside and baby, open up. Like open yeah. your brain. Let's talk. Yeah. Close your legs. Conversation. Let's open like, up. Like uh, that moment yeah. though, it had to be special. I mean, you. You and your girl on the track, you know, it's a big thing, right? Oh, yeah, I mean, at that time, you know, we weren't together. Oh, so not at the moment, okay, Yeah, sure. yeah, you know, I, I want to say that was, um, that experience was definitely one of the catalysts to pushing us closer okay, together. Okay, bet. But, um, yeah, that was just me reaching out to her, thinking that she would do an amazing job, like me just being a fan, 
and us just being friends at the time. And um, yeah, that was just me having a vision and be like, you would kill us, and she did. Right, so in 2012, you dropped the mixtape at 17, uh, 1999, the mixtape. Righteous Minds, super dope. You recently, last year, dropped 2000. Uh, but incrementally, you're going from 99 to 2000. I guess I would want to ask, what's next? You know, when it comes to your music, you know, acting, film, projects, what's next? I'm focused on showing people a, uh, a side of me that I don't, want, I don't, I don't want to say that they've never seen before, but just a side that they don't get as much. What I can say is this next body of work is definitely more in the frequency of love. Hmm. It's in the frequency of love, relationships, and my experiences with women. We're gonna see you and Rod Wave on the track. Shit, shit. That could be a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> that could be a good idea. For you real. talk, you talk about, you talking about love and relationship and all. You 28, you about to get off the market? Like, you, bro, you <laughs> build you up now. Yo, I would say, from rapping to now acting, we're, like, I would say your demographic of fans is growing. Definitely. Absolutely. Your attention is growing. Absolutely. And as you keep ascending in the world, you going off the market like that? Listen, man, like you said, I, I am 28, but I've been in the game like 11 years, man. So I've seen a lot, I've done a lot. Mm. I feel good where I'm at and with what I got. Speaking of that demographic expand, when did you when did you see the biggest jump? When you started acting? Yeah, for sure. I, I would say with Kanan. Like once I cut my hair and I went unique, I saw a different side of them streets, man. <laughs> for sure, for sure. You know, I remember Adris Elba saying something about not loving the character of Stringer Bell. And it being that America is one of the few places that could fall in love with the character that sinister, or that character who would, you know, at that time, Baltimore, especially when you're looking at the way crack was run, that, that was something that killed our communities. And he didn't love that people related to that character. Have, do you feel like playing a character like that makes people more attracted to you, more attracted to your talent, to your skill? Because like you said, we could see those people right outside our doors, right? Like I, you grew up, I grew up with uncles, cousins, homeboys who were in that. Do you feel like now since you've played that character, even from a community standpoint or the streets, people embrace you differently? Oh yeah, absolutely, I, was, I would say so. I believe that I've, I was always well embraced by the streets, but I think playing unique, gave the streets, like, they, they, it pretty much made them see themselves through me. And it just made the connectivity rise, you know what I'm saying, between me and them, because I feel like me projecting that character on screen communicates to them, like, he knows. You know what I'm saying? Like, he, he, he know what this life is about. He, he know what it, it entails. He done seen some shit because there ain't no way you could just, you don't just pull that from nowhere, you know what I'm saying? You know, there's a part in uh, season two, you're at your girl's house, mom's just tripping, asking when you're gonna go to work and all of those things, yeah. and uh, you're playing a game uh, with your baby, but you're a father in real life uh -huh. as well. What has that experience been like to have an opportunity to not only bring a life in the world, but care for her in the way that you do, how much did that change perspective for you? Oh man, it, it made me very soft. <laughs> <laughs> you know, cause I, I've, I have a daughter, yeah. you know what I'm saying? And um, it transformed me, man. It transformed me. Like, I remember before she was born, like the months to right before she was born. And I remember, sh I remember subconsciously feeling myself shifting into this higher gear. Like I was being way more productive than I've ever been. And I felt like it was the male version of nesting, mm. right? Like, you know, how, how women nest before that baby comes, they get in the crib right. For me, it was like, I, you know what I mean? I, I grew like a couple uh, more tentacles. You know what I'm saying? Like I went from an eight arm octopus to like a 12 arm. <laughs> you know right. what I'm saying? And yeah, it's definitely just made me more proactive. Um, my focus on being present is higher you know, from moment to moment, especially every moment with baby girl. I want to say attention to detail, all that, it's just, it's, it's improved me 
all across the board. I'm just sitting here and it dawned on me after RC asked you about uh, playing a character unique. Yeah. It, ju it just really hit me. I'm thinking School of the Performing Arts, music, acting, and Bishop, Juice, Tupac just came into my mind. Do you ever think that your path is similar to the path that Pac went on? Absolutely, you know, I wanna say that Tupac inspired me directly, you know, like, he's one of my greatest inspirations for that very fact, you know, that he was able to transcend just one avenue of the arts and success, you know, from the perspective of a young black man, so, I gotta say he's the number one for me as far as like what inspired me to believe that I could be a multi-faceted in the same way. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I, I almost look at it like I wanna pick up where he left off at. You know what I'm saying? Just in the terms of his life was cut short, unfortunately. But yeah, I wanna, I wanna fully, cause you know, people ask me now like, okay, so are you gonna stop the music? Are you just gonna focus on the acting? I'm like, yo, look, I'm gonna do both. Right. I feel like I got both of these jackrabbits like this. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And I'm gonna run with both of them. And I plan on doing that for as long as I can. I mean, music is just something that I feel is embedded in me. But as far as filming TV, acting, I feel like I'll be in that world forever. You know, pretty much at the end of time, whether it's producing, writing, if, even if it's not just on screen stuff, it's like, I'm very, infatuated with that whole world and even when it comes to inspiring the youth and the next generations like I feel like there's a lot of projects that I have in my mind that could help with just shifting that perception for our black youth and stuff like that so I definitely want to focus on that do you realize how high of a compliment that is though the fact that you started in music so young and you've been so accomplished both you know underground and commercially but you've you've transferred all of that talent into a new craft and you're that good at it that people ask you, are you gonna give up music? Right. Like, do, do you ever think to yourself how, how huge of a compliment that is? Actually, I've been thinking about it more recently in the light of the Drake Joe B Budden feud mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. what's going on, like how, you know. Right. But I like what Joe Budden said. He said, you know, sometimes you do the thing that gets you to the other thing. Right, it, it opens these doors. So I feel like I'm definitely grateful to be on a similar trajectory where one path was able to open up new doors for me. You know what I mean? Like, I don't take that lightly at all, but at the same time, I'm like, I ain't letting that door close, though. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, man, it's, it's, it's an honor, it's a pleasure, to say the least. Like, I mean, you know, recently, we've been on strike for the last few months. I'm blessed to say that, I was like, okay, I'm gonna just be in the studio. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. I'm, I'm gonna just, I got the time that I needed to finish this next album now, so now by the time I, I gotta go back on set for something, it's like, okay, music in the can, I could fully focus on here. You know, so it's, it's dope navigating both worlds, to say the least. What's more difficult? Oh, film, without a doubt. Why is that? Because, man, it, it's, it takes a bigger toll on you. Right, okay, so when it comes to music, it's like three aspects. You gotta make the music, right? Studio, sessions, but you know, it's a passion. So you enjoy that. You, you, it's like playing basketball. You, you go and you'll shoot around until you get tired, yep. right? Like you enjoy it. Nobody's even forcing you to go there. And then there's the touring, which is probably the hardest aspect of it, right? Dirty shows in a matter of four weeks damn near back-to-back -back days. But the thing with the show is, you wake up in the morning, you're on the tour bus, you're headed to the next location, all of the energy won't get spent till tonight. Mm. Whereas with film, you get that 4 a.m. pickup, then you gotta be in the hair and makeup by 6 a.m., then by 8 a.m. you're doing first looks, we're rehearsing the scene, and you're shooting all day. Yeah. You're not getting off till like 9 p.m. That's that's more than 12 hours. Like I've my first day on on a on a film set for Mr. Robot was a 13-hour day, and I was like, holy! <laughs> <laughs> I was like, whoa! I don't know if I want to do this for real. Right. You know, like to truth be told, I've been dodging number one on the call sheet for a minute, 
because I, I also have my other career, right? So like I didn't have as much time to play with as everybody else who's just fully focused on film. But also just because it takes such a toll. Like it is a self-neglecting process. Mm. You know what I mean? Like you're completely devoted to this production <laughs> and to whatever character you playing. Like who you are, Javon, <laughs> don't matter. Right. You know what I'm saying? You gotta be here for this. And it's like music, you could you could step in, you could step out, or like you know, in the hardest part, touring, you got all day to get your energy right. Right. This you just got to be ready, even if you ain't ready. You made the the basketball um, statement. I used to always compare that to what we did. Like none of us want to go out in the summer and put on pads and right. play football, but hoopers like yeah, it's fun to go to the gym, get shots up, right, and then when you're done, you're done. You go do whatever. And so I think when you look at film and just truly theater as a whole, you have to like fully embrace that character. And it's the more work. like football. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and the work that, that, that goes into it. Yeah. So that made, like you making that point makes a ton of sense. And man, we just appreciate your time. My question for you would, would be this though, what's the end goal? Like where do, you know, because you have, like you said, you have 12 tentacles. Right, and when you do have a lot of different talents and a lot of different gifts and also ambitions, sometimes it's hard to say, okay, what's enough for me? So in the end, what's enough for Javon? That's a great question. And my new philosophy is, you know, historically throughout my life, I've always had big lofty goals. But now it's less about the goals to me and it's more about the process. So what's next is, just improving my systems of functioning rather than writing out some new goals. I'm just like, okay, we know the direction we headed in. We know which way the ship is headed, right? We headed to progress and, you know, community and unity and highest level self-improvement. So now, you know, everything on the way is just fine tuning. It's fine tuning. Like, like I don't have a, an end goal. Mm -hmm. The goal is to make it to the end, is to make it as, as, as long as I can and to hope that what that leads for the generations is, for the next generations to come, is just inspiration and hope and motivation. Like the Tupac quote that I love, that always repeats in my mind is, you know, I doubt I'll be the one to change the world, but I'll definitely spark the mind that will. So it was like a each one teach one thing for me. No, that's hell. We got the call time from our producer, Alicia, back there. She said, we up at 6.30, we leaving at 7.30. I'm like, damn, I thought rappers don't start too late. We did Wayne at 12.30 in the morning. <laughs> oh, yeah. But then on the ride over, doing more research, there's a quote by Benjamin Franklin that, that you say you love, early to bear, early to uh, rise, makes a man healthy, wealthy, and, and, and wise. When did that mantra become an active part of your life? I'm trying to remember what book I was reading and uh, where that dawned on me at, but uh, just pretty much realizing that the only way to truly be our most progressive, fully functioning selves is to not take for granted or to, or to sleep on the aspect of time. You know, time is the only currency we can't get back, as we all know. So. Once I got privy to that fact, I was like, okay, cool. I have to make better use of my time. And if I'm gonna do that, I should be up earlier. Also, we're just kind of changing my whole health regimen as well. Like I like to wake up and go to the gym, you know, get active. I feel like that usually gives me more energy throughout my day as well. You know, I, now my journey is more about how can I find energy? Yep. You know, because I want to do so much. Like, it ain't easy having 12 tentacles. <laughs> I want to do so much. So it's like, now it's about how, where, where, can I, where can I pull this energy from, you know, to continue to give myself the, uh, the willpower to, to carry on, you know what I'm saying? Because the, the problem for me has never been what I wanted to do. It's just been about doing it, you know? And as a follow-up to that, we always ask our guests what has been their biggest pivot in life. Mm. That moment that you can go back and identify as life-changing to, to have oh, you easy. here to this point. What's your biggest easy. pivot? Easy. My biggest pivot was when I made myself the priority. 
And that happened uh, around 2020, about three years ago, you know? And um, I feel like since then, it's been an upward trajectory, you know? I feel like my life was always on the incline, but that was definitely by far my biggest pivot. And, and that's the message that I like to try to give to the youth, especially the black youth, because I feel like the way that we come up and the way that we're raised it's so much survivor's guilt instilled in us from an early age. You know, you feeling bad about making it because all the other people around you not making it or you gotta, you know, you got a lot of people to help out. And what that does for a lot of us is it creates some type of inertia. It creates, it becomes too heavy of a burden and you actually don't get nowhere because you, you, you pour from this empty cup. So once I started pouring more inward, not only did I have more to share with others, I never get dehydrated now. You know what I'm saying? I'm never empty. Like, I always have something to replenish myself from. And, you know, I, I, I strongly believe that if you're not good, nothing that you do or create can be great. You know what I'm saying? Like, you got to take care of you first. And that's with everything. That's with parenting. That's with career. That's with love, you know, you got to make sure you in a state where you can provide and nurture for self before you provide and nurture for others in the world. That's a fact. That's a fact. Yeah, I mean, I think, man, you know, shoot, I learned a ton, not only about you, but just in educating myself through this time. But what I would say is, man, like, the process is progress. Right, and success is just a destination that's moved by our goals. You know, so you're going about it the right way and pouring into you, allowing you to pour into others, but making sure your cup always has something. Because if you're not doing, and if you're not accomplishing, then the tentacles that you want to reach other people can't either. Right. Man, we appreciate your time, bro. This was dope. Thank y'all, man. I appreciate y'all time. Yeah, I'm definitely about to go unsend those messages, though. <laughs> <laughs> appreciate That's you, boy. That was love. That was dope, boy. Appreciate, appreciate you, bro. That was dope. For sure. No, who, uh, who cuts your hair for the show? Do you have your own barber or do they oh, have... Oh, yo, I got... They, um... they stack that joint. <laughs> yeah, they... a... Hold up. Limitless. They can send me a cap in it. I thought they here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Way I'm feeling, got me up. Uh, on the mission, got me up. Uh, knowing me, I got the key. Uh, only vision I can trust. Uh, trust. Uh, limitless. They can send me a cap in it. I thought they here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Way I'm feeling, got me up. Uh, on the mission, got me up.